Hello everyone, welcome to MHTV. We're really delighted to have you with us tonight. We've got a very special guest who we'll introduce just in one minute. But before we do that, obviously we want you to join in as well. We want you to have a conversation with us tonight. And um, so I'll, let's go to Vanessa before we get started with introductions and things like that, so that she can tell you how you can join in. Vanessa? Hi everyone, um, hope you're gonna tune in to tonight's conversation. Um, you can join in via social media in one of two ways, either over on Twitter, just by following the hashtag MHTV, you should be able to see the dialogue there. I'll be tweeting throughout the episode. Um, we'd love it if you've got any questions, comments that we can feed into the discussion. So do put your tweets out to us. If you're more of a Facebook person over on Facebook, you just need to follow the Unite mm -hmm. MHNA page and you should see the live stream pop up there. Again, you know, any comments, questions, do feed them in through the live stream there and we'll bring them into tonight's discussion. It makes it much more interesting if we get questions and engagement. So, yeah, do join in. Brilliant. We've all come to our very special guest, Paul. We've got a half special guest. Mike, can you just introduce yourself, please? I'm Mike, Mike Ramsey, um, uh, special lead for mental health at the University of Dundee School of Health Sciences, uh, and I'm here because we have a particular Scottish focus tonight, so I'm um, having a, a, a Scottish guest presenter um, was thought to be appropriate. Absolutely. So Dave's behind the camera, but let's come to our very special guest tonight. Thank you, Paul, for, for spending time with us. Can you tell people a little bit about, about yourself? Well, thanks very much, Nikki, for the kind invitation uh, to to join you all tonight. Um, my background, um, I became a Unite member long before I got involved in elected politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually started my career in the shipbuilding industry in Glasgow, um, in line with generations of my family uh, working in the kind of manufacturing industry. Um, got heavily involved in politics just through a general interest in, in mm -hmm. the Labour Party, Labour heritage, also through... Uh, the sort of tumultuous political events that have happened in Scotland in the last few years, particularly the referendum on independence. Uh, and then, of course, there was a snap election in 2017 in which I was lucky enough um, to be selected to stand for uh, the constituency I was born and brought up in, in, in Springburn, in the northeast of Glasgow. Uh, was elected, I think it was at 50 to 1 at the bookies, the, the bookies odds, uh, on a majority of 200 votes um, and became an MP. Uh, did that for a couple of years, uh, lost my seat. Um, in 2019 in the, the other snap election uh, went through a pretty tough personal period during the pandemic uh, you know it is all unexpectedly um, and then was fortunate enough to be reselected to stand um, as a member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow uh, in May 2021 when I was elected to the Scottish Parliament and since the start of this year I've been uh, doing a role as the Labour Party's um, Shadow Minister for Mental Health in Scotland mm -hmm. uh, but I also cover the role of um, spokesperson for veterans affairs in Scotland as well, um, which is a significant crossover, um, which mm. I'm sure we'll discuss uh, later on this evening. Um, delighted to be here as a night member and as a parliamentarian um, to advance the interests of our of our common cause. Thanks. Yeah, we're really delighted to have you. So let's go over to Mike then to start with some questions. Give you a proper grilling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Paul. Um, as we uh, as you've discussed that. Um, You've got a brief for um, veterans uh, welfare, and uh, uh, there's obviously been significant interest over, I guess, over the last 20 years in particular in, in veterans' mental health care. Um, I wonder if you could tell me something about uh, your, your interests and your and your position on veterans' mental health care. Yeah, I mean, my personal interest in veterans affairs comes from my my own background. I was an army reservist um, for 12 years, uh, in fact, uh, in an infantry reserve regiment in Glasgow. Um, and several of my own friends uh, have died. Uh, you know, in fact, it's the 10th anniversary since one of my best friends was was killed in an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan uh, at the age of just 25. Um, and, you know, it was... I often think about the, the the trauma of that and uh, going to a funeral uh, where the eulogy was delivered by his identical twin brother, uh, you know, so it's a, you know, a harrowing experience for a young person to go through mm. um, at any age. And I have a personal awareness of the impact that had not just on myself, but also many thousands of other people uh, who have had similar experiences. We know that the recent conflicts, um, as we see just in the last few days, um, you know, never far from, from our thoughts but certainly you know the recent conflict still cast a big shadow over our population today uh, and I think we're going to find from recent census data that was carried out in Scotland with the first time it's identified veterans uh, we'll see a significant footprint 
Um, there was talk of just today at the launch of the Poppy Scotland appeal. One in seven families in Scotland will have a connection to service uh, in the military of some kind. So it's a big footprint. Uh, and we know a lot of that is associated with difficulty. Um, and many people, you know, many veterans have got you know, brilliant contributions in civilian life as well. Uh, you know, but there is, you know, a exposure to particular stresses, uh, which, you know, the bulk of the population will experience. So um, I do have a deep personal interest in it. Um, I think there's great models out there uh, which work well. SAFA, for example, uh, in Glasgow, run a organisation called Glasgow's Helping Heroes, which is a one-stop shop casework service, which is a fantastic low threshold way for people to present and get assistance. Uh, even things like proactively, you know, running clubs and um, activities for for veterans, uh, which helps to engage in a more proactive basis. And it does take a lot for veterans who typically would bottle things up or try and bury things. Uh, to admit they have a difficulty, um, you know, so these kind of organisations do fantastic work. So it's just my job really to be uh, an amplifier of good practice uh, and to try and identify opportunities to improve the situation for, for veterans informed by a, a, some degree of personal experience. Thank you so much. I've got some questions that have come through and we've, we've prepared in advance, if that's all right with you. And yeah, I guess absolutely. One, one of the things that was um, a question that came up from students particularly was how how can you influence politics? I think sometimes a lot of young people, people at the start of careers as well, feel like the decisions being made so far above their head. It's actually quite hard to keep kind of hopeful about things. And I wondered if you had any sort of suggestions on how people can engage and influence. Yeah, well, I think... Um... Politics generally is a school of negative learning, <laughs> and it's often <laughs> that is beautifully uh, put. <laughs> and even uh, even I ask myself that question on a daily, an almost daily basis. Um, certainly from opposition, it's frustrating as well. But yeah. I think the lesson I've learned is um, that you have expertise, you have insights, you're bringing lived experience to the fore, um, yeah. and that is critical, critically important. Um, so own that and you know enter into the space and own it you know I think that's the key thing for me mm -hmm. um, you know there are huge insights that people bring um, that inform parliamentarians that people who become parliamentarians can bring in to things so I would say you know have confidence in what you can say uh, and to influence that use your trade union networks use it to build your power uh, and, you know, understand that, you know, Parliament isn't some sort of hierarchical organisation where you aren't entitled to connect to it. I'd say that uh, my job, as I see it, is to act as an advocate for working people. Uh, and, you know, the insights you can bring are, are critical. You know, I'm doing a campaign with Unite Workers, Unison Workers, GMB Workers just now about community link workers in Glasgow connecting people in GP mm. surgeries to other services. That's been informed by the expertise from the coalface mm. about what works. Um, so I would say that that couldn't have happened, you know, that effort and pressure to ask the First Minister directly in Parliament to do something to fix this problem wouldn't be happening unless it was informed by workers who are in that role, you know, 70 community link workers working uh, with GPs uh, in practices across uh, Glasgow, some of the you know most deprived communities are telling us what needs to happen to fix things and move things in the right direction. I wouldn't have that knowledge or insight personally. Uh, as I said, my background is, is shipbuilding, not mental health. <laughs> You know, so I rely on on com comrades in the trade union movement to to give me the, the ammunition to feed into the parliament to to to, to hold government to account. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's that's critical. Don't underestimate your own your own insight and your own expertise. I've got um an, another question, which is actually quite a quite a direct one. I'm not sure you'll be able to answer this exactly, but one of the first years is asked um, I write I've written to my politician. I guess they mean member of parliament. Um, how do I know how do I know what to write to get them to listen to me? How do I know that they're reading them? <laughs> I can't speak for everyone, but well, that's what uh, I figured. No, right? I but generally the speaking, when someone writes to you, what happens? What's the process? Uh, well, the process for me is um, to you know sit with the team and go through our casework uh, and to you know refer to it. You know, if, if and particularly if I know it's a trade union colleague who's mm. getting in touch with me, um, you know, I, I do pay attention to that and I do recognize their their particular role representing workers mm. um, you know so I think that's critical as well mm. uh, just the very fact that you're bringing an insight from a workplace is important mm. uh, and you know it can be simply asking to come along to a meeting at a surgery or you know offering something directly through email it mm. tends to be picked up in action in some way um, you know it can often be a uh, you know, personal issue, but also often it is a professional issue that you're trying to raise. Um, 
I'd just say that, you know, just be to the point. You don't need to preface things with an essay. You know, the, the, the you know the more succinct, the better. Just straight to the point. And um, what do you need from from the parliamentarian? Uh, and and hopefully, if they're if they're any good, they will will we'll treat that seriously. Um, but what I'd also say is be persistent. Um, if you're not getting a timely response, be persistent with it. Um, you know, don't don't hold back. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, be direct. Just get on with it and keep going. I quite like that. That boils down some good advice. Um, we'll come back to Mike in just a second, but I've got a question here, obviously, from Dave, who's a bit more of a politics monster, I think, than all of us put together. He wanted to know a couple of things. He wanted to talk a little bit about Labour's priorities for mental health in Scotland. And he wanted to know a little bit about the differences between Holyrood and Westminster. Um, well, Labour's plans for, for mental health in Scotland are informed by the fact that we need to get a, a parity of esteem on how we treat it with physical health care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, research from the Royal College of Psychiatrists recently um, published showed that 58% um, of people in Scotland think that mental health services receive too little of the healthcare budget. Um, and indeed, the Scottish Government have tacitly admitted that because they've mm -hmm. set a target that 10% of NHS expenditure in Scotland uh, mm -hmm. should be allocated to mental health. Currently, it's only 8.7%, so we're still shy of that 10% target. That equates to £180 million pounds a year short. Um, and the government, you know, I recently just asked the First Minister this a couple of weeks ago in Parliament, what is he doing to sort this out? Wasn't a particularly convincing response, to be honest with you. And the Health Minister, similarly, I think they're all keeping their cars close to their chest because it's the budget rounds about to come up at this side of the year. Mm -hmm. It was in the years that the budget rounds. Um, so they'll all be squabbling about what allocations go where. But I think we need to be key that mental health is a thread that runs through every aspect of public policy. Uh, and someone's going to pick up the tap somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing Absolutely. that really frustrates me. Um, mm -hmm. Currently in the UK and in Scotland, uh, similarly, we have the biggest share of public expenditure going on at acute hospitals and treating react in a reactive way the, the consequences of not getting into prevention cycle mm -hmm. and building resilience within communities. Um, it's usually fallen to the police to attend these things, not men trained mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. but then, you know, people are ending up in a much more severe illness um, that produces a, a kind of crisis feedback loop into the National Health Service um, and it ends up costing the public purse more. And at the end of the financial years, we've just seen, you know, panic decisions of local government cutting critical services in communities that help to improve mental health, that help to create resilience, to create a sense of cohesion, a sense of purpose. Mm. Uh, it all feeds back into a sense of hopelessness, despair uh, and decline in our communities. And I think it's really worrying being Scotland is... Um, that for the first time we're seeing health, uh, sorry, life expectancy stagnate. We're actually seeing it start in the 20% poorest communities in Scotland start to go backwards for the first time ever. Uh, this is a shocking consequence of what's going on. It's a broader economic issue. We're facing declining living standards, etc. Mm. Um, but we have to realise that this is part of a whole ecosystem and just treating it as individual budget silos isn't good enough. Uh, mm. You know, There's no easy way out of this. Uh, and you know we need to treat it more with an economic analysis rather than mm. accountancy. Mm. Uh, you know, that's the key thing. So looking at how we take best practice, I talked about this community link workers, for example, really good interface. We know that people go to their GP with a lot of different problems uh, and they need someone there who will help put things together for them. You know, there's mm. often a lot of chaotic situations going on, particularly in deprived backgrounds. Real poverty is very stressful, mm. uh, very expensive for people. Uh, just having that person who can help stabilize things in the round whether it's housing social work psychiatric support uh, as well as you know clinical support in the sense of you know seeing a gp about a physical problem or mental health problem uh, is important mm -hmm. um so having that rounded approach mm -hmm. uh, is, is critical i learned a lot of that myself through dealing with scotland's drug death emergency uh, the insight i got from that uh, running an unofficial overdose prevention pilot in glasgow in 2020 mm -hmm. Mm. Um, was that people were self-medicating for severe yeah. mental health problems. That was what the drugs uh, problem was largely about. Um, and we just aren't helping people in deep despair. Mm. It's uh, interesting, isn't it? Because when you look at you know what works for veterans, having one place that's there to take care of the problems, and then we don't do that for everybody else when it makes so much sense to have one-stop uh, shops. Absolutely. And it's so hard now to even access NHS services at the front door now. Yeah. Uh, GPs, and if people have a chaotic situation in their lives, they're not able to necessarily plan in advance mm -hmm. and keep appointments and so on. Mm -hmm. So people just uh, end up in a real spiral of despair. Mm -hmm. uh, and for and for too many people, that ends up in premature death. 
Yes. Um, so we need to realise the real cost to not just those people who are affected, but the wider community. For sure. um, so I, I think if I was going to offer one um, ethos, it's that holistic thinking that we haven't really done as a government before. Mm -hmm. um, it's trying to understand that simply throwing money at acute services isn't going to necessarily solve the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about building more resilience and more prevention into the system. Uh, that That's really at the core of it as well. Um, mentioned that idea of having things like link workers, having those support workers within GPs practices. The aim is to get that into every practice in Scotland. But speaking to GPs, they're saying we're so hard pressed. We don't even have time to step back and think about how we can improve services. We've just got people queuing out the door. We're doing clinics every day. How do we build that capacity so we can help GPs practices get into that position where they can improve services? We need to reinforce them with targeted resources and expertise to get there. Mm -hmm. um, we need to look at creation of mental health a &E departments as well. We have a lot of people presenting at A&E. We have police attending. Uh, yeah. I speak to my friend as a police officer in Glasgow. He's yeah. very often his shifts are taken up with uh, acute mental health problems, not necessarily criminal problems. Mm -hmm. Is that an appropriate use of a blue light service when we don't have alternatives? Mm -hmm. We need to build those alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's lots of things we need to do. Absolutely. <laughs> we need to start, really. If you take <laughs> up an hour, like you're going to be busy. <laughs> uh, certainly, but the more you dig into it, the more you yep. start to realise it's part of a bigger ecosystem um, that we need sure. to you know, build national resilience around. Let's uh, go to Mike briefly then. Hey. Yeah. Um, if I could just tease out a couple of things there, Paul, that you said, um, the link workers is a, a new concept to me. Um, who would these workers be? Do you, who, do you, who do you see them being? Because I'm, I'm just a bit worried about um, that being attractive potentially to mental health nurses when we're already short of mental health nurses. Um, because of a difficulty in recruiting and attracting and retaining mental health nurses in post, who, who would you see being the link workers? Well, I think they're clinically trained professionals. I think in the case of um, some of them in Glasgow, um, they can be like, people with a money advice background. They can be a myriad of different qualifications. I mean, I think that's an important point about making sure people are properly qualified and you know happy to look at feedback on that. They would certainly be referring potentially to mental health nurses. Uh, they might not necessarily be mental health practitioners themselves. Um, they could be, in some cases, clinically trained. I'm open-minded about how we, we do that. I think it's a conversation we need to have with trade union colleagues about the, the suite of qualifications that might be necessary. I know certainly a lot of the link workers in Glasgow are represented by GMB, for example, um, and they might not necessarily have a, a, a mental health uh, nursing background, um, but I'm more than happy to, to, you know, to, to further develop that. Also looking at how we structure contracts. You know, I'm speaking to a lot of, uh, for example, mental health nurses in schools, counsellors in schools. Mm. Um, they are casualised because they're working on, you know, third sector contracts, which are very precarious. How do we improve the, the resilience of that? A lot of the issues with retaining people is the fact that there's no security. Um, you know, they're, they're year to year contracts. They're always, it's got a sword of Damocles hanging above them. Uh, and, and annual budget cycles. I don't know what's going to happen with a health and social care partnership in Scotland, or, you know, partnership between the local authority and the health board, just decide to cut the funding. We know in Glasgow, for example, there's going to be 20 million pounds of cuts coming down the line with the health and social care partnership in the city. Um, totally unsustainable and totally shocking what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of good projects doing very uh, good preventative work being shut down as a consequence, which is a false economy, as I've already outlined. Um, but yeah, in terms of the suite of qualifications, I think that's part of a you know policy development process that will be going through with trade union colleagues as we move closer to the Scottish elections in 2026. But hopefully the intent at least is, is indicated there. We think it's a good pr principle to move forward on having that capacity within GP surgeries as a front front door to the system. Um, not always necessarily needing a clinical intervention, but you know, at least it's somewhere to go. And a similar model that we've learned from the likes of SAFA, how they manage veterans in, in Glasgow. One thing I wanted to pick up on was you, you touched on um, the, the, the problem we have in Scotland with the high, high level, particularly in our deprived urban communities with uh, of drug-related deaths. And um, there's been people outside who are listening outside Scotland might not be aware of the debate around safe consumption rooms. I wondered if you, you had a position to mention about safe consumption rooms in Scotland. Yeah, um, it's something that the health board in Glasgow have been trying to promote since 2017. Uh, and there's been a bit of an impasse with the Home Office about, uh, you know, giving permission for it because it's still regulated under the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act, which is an archaic piece of legislation, mm -hmm. um, which often causes more damage than it, than it, than it prevents, really. Uh, it's more of a war of on people who use drugs and 
a lot of people who are very vulnerable end up in the criminal justice system uh, and end up in a really bad situation. Uh, overdose prevention centres are operating in around 16 countries in the world just now. Um, in fact, I just came back last week from visiting one of the pioneer projects in Copenhagen, uh, met the mayor of Copenhagen, uh, and the, the similarities with Glasgow's situation were striking. Um, you know, street injecting drug population often with associated trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and it was highly controversial at the time when this was introduced uh, about 10 years ago. Um, but in that process, they've supervised over one and a half million injections and they've reversed over 1,500 overdoses. Um, not all of them would have been fatal, but they certainly would have saved several hundred lives in the process. Even the unofficial pilot in Glasgow, we had just shy of 900 presentations to inject there. Uh, in about a you know nine month period, um, in the, in the course of that there were um nine overdoses involving eight people, um, uh, so you know arguably we saved eight people's lives just doing that unofficial pilot in Glasgow in twenty twenty. One thing that really stuck with me though was a young girl who came along. She was maybe about uh, nineteen, um, she'd been a victim of um sexual abuse in care. Uh, she so she'd fled her care home. She was sleeping rough in in Glasgow, and she was also a sex worker. Um, but she was, you know, you know, administering drugs basically as a sort of anaesthetic, um, and just by engaging with volunteers at the the facility, there were mental health nurses who volunteered, there were nursing professionals who volunteered, there were medical students who volunteered, um, as as well as just people with no clinical background like myself. But the one thing that she said was, you know, just having that cup of tea, that conversation. Uh, that sense of validation to be treated with respect and dignity for the first time in a long time was enough for her to feel motivated to to seek help and, and get into treatment. Um, so she wrote to us um, a few months after the pilot finished just to say, you know, thanks for saving our life. You know, she'd overdosed twice uh, as a, you know, in that, in that facility. Mm. Um, and, you know, we, we, we were able to reverse the effect of the, the, the heroin overdose, but the reality was what was needed was, pastoral support uh, in a sense of, um, you know, giving her a sense of resilience and uh, just treating her with respect, you know, so that for me was a demonstration that the overdose prevention pilot does save lives and is a useful intervention. It's not going to solve all the problems. Uh, one of the big problems I've got in Scotland is the use of street uh, benzodiazepines, uh, so Valium uh, and how we treat some of these highly addictive drugs. Um, they aren't necessarily going to be helped with the overdose prevention facility. But we need it's certainly a useful intervention amongst many that we can we can deploy. Um, but until we start treating people with respect, meeting them where they're at, yeah. uh, and 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 fundamentally having dignity at the heart of what we're doing, you know, we're just going to end up continuing with the, the worst death rates to to drugs in Europe, um, which is a terrible, terrible toll. And we know that Dundee, uh, like Glasgow, has a particularly acute problem there, uh, where we're losing someone at a rate of you know, in Scotland, one death every eight hours to a preventable drug-related death. Um, even at the height of the COVID pandemic, if you're under 50, you're still statistically more likely to die of a of a drugs overdose than you were to die of COVID. Yet the response from the public authorities, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, not nearly as urgent. Uh, so there is a social justice element to this as well. You're 18 times more likely to die of a drug overdose if you come from a deprived background. Yeah, uh, exactly. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, I know you've got some questions come through. Um, have we? Um, yeah, we've got one. Yeah, we've got one, yeah. From, yeah, we've got one from um, Dan Warrender, haven't we? So I'll just hmm. come to that. So um, Dan's asking, um, and I'm not sure you'll be able to answer this, but it's an interesting question that's very current. Um, what what you might be able to do about mental health nurses receiving less mental health focus in undergraduate training in Scotland? Um, and what kind of skill set you think that the workforce might need in the future? So the issue is obviously the whole the whole national debate around um nurses in training currently receiving much less mental health training than they used to do and they've been much more focused on physical health skills. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting point, and I'm more than happy to you know to take that comment away. I mean, I'd, I'd invite you to use the roots of Parliament to raise these concerns. I'm more than happy to ask ministers about that you know question okay. if you want to follow up by email. Um, also, it's worth noting the um, 
the route through to um, the public petitions committee as well in the parliament. It only requires one signature to get a petition heard in the parliament. So if you have ideas about improving public policy, um, you know, you can certainly use the public petitions route. Online takes about 10 minutes and you can actually, you know, come to the parliament and make a, you know, make a statement. Uh, you can raise uh, these issues and there can be actually an inquiry done. Um, a good example of that was um, justice for people who suffered chronic pain as a result of transvaginal mesh implants. That was raised through the public petitions route and it changed the whole basis in which we treat um, some of these issues, uh, some of these conditions in Scotland. Um, certainly also had a lot of um, communication with student nurses about how difficult financing is, the bursaries in Scotland being inadequate, um, people having to leave training early, know the average age of a, of a nursing trainee is much higher than the average student, it, usually in their early 30s, um, often people with caring responsibilities already. Um, we need to design a programme of early careers development for, for nursing that's much more resilient and we don't lose people in training. Mm. Um, I think the, that's a key issue and a key vulnerability we need to, to look at. But in terms of the balance of the curriculum or the teaching content, I think that's important as well. I actually just visited... Um, Chaz, the children's hospices, and the similarly, they were saying, you know, lack of specialist routes into hospice training. Large part mm -hmm. of that would be mental health as well, because of the the, the grief and trauma associated with hospice care, um, particularly amongst children. Um, yeah. You know, so I think we need to look at how we create more specialised routes at an earlier stage for people who have a real vocation in those areas, or a real interest in those areas to specialise. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm open minded about that. Again, I want to be guided by you. Mm. Uh, I want to actually take your expertise to the fore of how we drive public policy in Scotland. Um, mm. I'm not sitting here with a set of answers to everything. No, exactly. uh, the, the, the role of the parliamentarian is to be a, a kind of glorified switchboard operator <laughs> to connect you to the heart of power, you know, mm. um, and and really, if you have the ideas and, and, the, and the, they stand up to scrutiny, then I'm you're more than happy to, to take them in and, and, and argue for them. Yeah, I think that message is really important because, as you say, a lot of this is about social justice and a lot of the issues that we're raising are from people who don't actually have voices a lot of the time. So if we're able to facilitate that process, for me, it's quite refreshing to hear. I mean, what you were saying then about the end-of-life care agenda, for example, you know, people in prison and people who are homeless are often left off the agenda when they're kind of looking at end-of-life care for people. We're thinking about people who are more, in, you know, mainstream rather than people actually who are often really excluded from services. Yeah. You know, certainly, you know, working in prisons, some of the stuff that you were saying around drug use certainly chimes with a lot of the people who I see in prison who are there, you know, because they're vulnerable um, and criminalised really for, you know, just trying to survive because they're poor, which is, you know, forcing pe forces people to commit crimes. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's really it refreshing. A, to hear. It was a revelation for me. I, I, I represent the biggest male prison in Scotland, um, Barlini, and... Visiting mm. there for the first time yeah. was a shocking experience for me. You know, yeah. I can only describe it as a social dump, a dumping ground. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, the amount of people there with, you know, some cases quite severe uh, mental health problems, uh, learning difficulties, um, you know, uh, but not really had any support mm. through their lives. Um, and obviously there are a lot of people who need to be kept away from the community because um, they've done bad, terrible things. But... You know, there's a lot of people in prison who actually just need help to get their lives back on track and they're just not being well served at all. Um, and then we end yeah. up in a vicious cycle of recidivism, destructive, chaotic lifestyles um, that are never really solved. I mean, it was quite striking. Again, going back to my example from the overdose prevention pilot, people coming straight down the, the from in the bus from Barlini to, to buy drugs in town, inject, shoplift. And, and the, the prison office was open to me. He said, well, liberate someone on the Friday. They'll be back on the Monday. You know, they're serving yeah. life sentences in short bursts for often petty antisocial behaviour related crimes and so on to often feed addictions and so on. Uh, we're not yeah. thinking holistically about how we deal with that. And it's at a cost of, what, £35,000 a year to keep someone in prison. You know, think of the opportunity yeah. cost there for the public policy. Um, yeah, it's, insan exactly. it's insanity, really, uh, in, in, in the true sense of the word, to continue on this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, again, we need to have a much more rounded approach to how we deal with that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll come back to Mike again in a minute. So get ready, Mike. <laughs> um, but before we do that, um, Paul, it would be really interesting if we could touch on on your experience, you know, because it's it's not 
it's not usual for people to decide, right, I'm going to be a politician. <laughs> I'm not saying you're weird. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Billy Conley has said the desire to be a politician should bar you from life ever being one. <laughs> I'm going to say, you, you, you know, you've, you decided that this is a choice that you want to make. And I, I, want, I would like you just to talk a little bit about how you came to make that decision. And then when you when you lost your seat, how you got yourself back up again and motivated, because a lot of people are really have been through and are going through really tough times when, you know, life isn't turning out the way they thought it was going to and people have to make some really big life choices. And I just wondered how, how that happened for you and what helped you. Well, you know, the reason I wanted to go into politics was because I was frustrated about lack of progress in the workplace I was in. There was, you know, I saw loads of things we could be doing better as a country, um, as an industry in shipbuilding. And, and, you know, I always thought growing up, you know, it was it was sad to see an industry. It was one, the pride of the country in decline. Uh, I really wanted to turn that around and get some pride back into our community and our city. Mm. Felt like I, you know, could do something about that um, by standing for Parliament. Um, feel like I'm at least able to make those arguments, um, you know. And and, I, and the more you kind of get engaged, if you're a naturally curious person and want to help solve problems, you know, you find that you can be useful in some ways of being mm. an advocate for things in a myriad of different ways. And I'm finding that in my role now. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, I guess there's a sense of invincibility when you're younger, or a sense of resilience, which can sometimes be misplaced when you're younger. Yeah. Um, and you, you get a bit of a rude awakening. And of course, when I did lose my seat in uh, 2019, it was probably the first major setback I'd had. Like, I'd never been out of work since I was like 14 and had a paper round. Mm. Uh, you know, I'd found that really difficult to adjust to the deafening silence of just being stuck in the house and staring at four walls during these lockdowns. Um, you know, it was deeply frustrating and, and 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 it was chastening as well. You know, it had a you know really bad effect on my self esteem. Mm. Obviously, politics is one of the last kind of socially acceptable blood sports out there where people are quite vicious about you, particularly in social media. Yeah, uh, there isn't much sympathy out there. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was personally very challenging. Um, I, you know, I did have suicidal thoughts. I was, uh, you know, in a, a bad place in, in some in some points. Um, a sense of hopelessness was was palpable. Um, I guess just having friends to connect to and be honest with people was was the important thing to talk about it. Mm. Um, but I also think it showed to me that no matter what kind of prestigious job you might have, most workers in this country, you know, have less than a few hundred quid in the bank. Yeah. Uh, and you know this uh, any kind of thing a relationship breaking up a job being lost can spiral very quickly into a, a desperate situation mm. so i think it showed me that for most workers in this country uh, who rely on waged income you know they're very precarious and we need to be much more cognizant of that fact that we need to have a much more resilient social security system uh, we need to remove the shame from need uh, you know i signed on to universal credit when i realized i just didn't have any other option uh, you know, we need to be much more open about that, you know, mm. about uh, the fact that sometimes people will need that and mm. it should be much better at supporting people. Mm. Um, you know, I, I had all the qualifications you needed to do a decent job. It wasn't anything about my lack of willingness. It was just a set of circumstances at that time. And I think a lot of the narratives that have crept in in recent years that are about workers and shirkers and, and skivers. We know that most people relying on Social Security in this country today are in work. Yeah, they're doing all the right things, but the economy isn't capable of equipping them with the necessary uh, salary to make ends meet and to live a basic standard of a living. Mm. Uh, that's a failure of public policy. It's not a failure of their efforts, yeah. you know, and I think the sooner we recognise that, the better. Mm. So I think, yeah, that was a very shocking personal realisation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but mm. um, I suppose, uh, what does it say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? So, um mm. Uh, taking a bit of a chance yeah. but yeah <laughs> yeah that's true but that 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 certainly did help uh, make me a more rounded person I'd hope you know so uh oh, I'm sure I'm so sure. Uh, I think I think um if it's any reassurance to people you know it doesn't matter even if you're an MP uh you can you can sometimes just be two paychecks away from destitution you know yeah 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 I think that you, you're absolutely right calling out the kind of language that's used about people in vulnerable situations as well it's very yeah. easy, isn't it, to, for us to be on. We're, we're like this and other people are like that. And the thing that is happening to them is happening to them because it's their fault. And it's we, uh, time and time again during this discussion, it's cl that's clearly not true. Yeah, yeah. there's so, a lot of things in, in about mental health in our country that 
we need to recognize it as a cultural challenge as much as anything else you know yeah. whether it is about talking about bereavement uh mm. grief mm. uh whether it is talking about how we treat each other you know um yeah. how we support each other and recognize some of the toxic narratives that are out there mm. um or, or even things like um you know being able to admit that you're you're struggling you know mm. i think a lot of us yeah. culturally will bottle that up uh yeah, sure. it's not it's not polite to talk about these things or talk about yourself you know um and I think there's a lot of things we need to overcome as a society to improve our overall well-being and happiness. Um, that, that's that's definitely a, a key mm. a key part of it all. Mm. Mike, did you? We're getting get to a stage where we have sort of last questions now. <laughs> did you have anything you yeah. wanted to bring up? Yeah, I, I I don't think my master students um, would forgive me if I didn't ask this question and indulge myself in a couple of questions. Um, one is around um, that's come up uh, in our own. Um, uh, tutorials, our online tutorials, um, is around certain uh, parts of Scotland and the provision of CAM services um, and this kind of logjam, the ability, the times taken to get people into CAM services or in some places don't have inpatient units um, and uh, stories of um, safe, safeguarding children by putting them into general paediatric wards in the local general hospital. Uh, we seem to have um, uh, had record investment. I don't have the figures, but we seem to have had record investment in the amount, certainly the amount of my students who their, their first posts uh, and their careers are set within child and adolescent mental health. But we still hear these um, um, very true um, narratives from, from practitioners. And I wondered what we might do to address um, uh, particularly the, the mental well being of our young. Well, as a key, key issue, and I think the pandemic showed that uh you know the severe pressure that young people faced i think we're still you know we're still seeing the effects of that of a, a cohort of young people who spent two years you know without proper social interaction um you know we're still fully understanding what happened without proper you know schooling um we know that in scotland the target is that 90 percent of children and young people referred to cam should start treatment within 18 weeks of their initial referral and the latest uh, figures show that just about 74% are being seen within that time frame. It's just not acceptable. Uh, and also, how, you know, what's the qualitative effect of that consultation? Can it just be a tick box exercise? Are they getting the full, you know, scope of treatment that is appropriate for their needs? I don't think it's necessarily the case. Um, you know, that's already creating a compounding effect of poor mental health amongst children and young people who have had that effect of the pandemic. And, mm -hmm. As we know, many specialist vacancies in, in the CAM service are going unfilled and we need to ensure those roles are attractive to staff and that workers are paid and treated fairly. And we know that there has been a long-standing issue with uh, recruitment and retention in this area. Um, yeah. And indeed, like you say, appropriate facilities for, for, ch for children and young people in mental health settings. It's easier in larger cities and urban settings, but we don't want to also remove people from communities. That's a big tension. They, yeah. I know that the Health Committee in the Parliament is about to undertake an inquiry into rural health care. Um, so, you know, having that information from Unite members and forming that inquiry would be really helpful. And everyone's got the skin in the game here. You know, the, I've had cases that I've dealt with with people who have been at the end of their tether with it. It has a huge effect, not just on the child who has that problem yeah. and needs help, but, you know, the whole family unit is affected by that uh, yeah. and for months yeah. on end. It creates a really destabilising and difficult effect for a whole family and um, casts a huge shadow Um, can often impact on work. Um. You know, siblings, yeah. um, we need to understand the wider costs of yeah. not having timely treatment. Um, but there's also a bit building capacity in settings like schools, um, you know, looking at that counselling service as well. Um, like I say, it's been on a knife edge in the last financial year, just to, whether their contracts were going to be renewed. Um, so having that element of a triaging approach as well, having more resilience within school settings, for example, will help upstream prevention. Uh, so then everything's not just getting dumped into CAMS when it might not be necessarily the most appropriate uh, mm. place for people to be referred to. Um, you know, I'm not sure if there's any information about whether there's inappropriate presentations or referrals to CAMS, but I think that's part of the equation as well. Um, and often just that sense of the whole system being overwhelmed at a crisis, people are burnt out, people are feeling that there's no satisfaction, uh, um, they're therefore leaving the role. Um, I think that's creating a vicious cycle in Scotland right now, and we need to find a way together um, to to sort of unravel that and, and make it more sustainable. Um, yeah. Hopefully that is at least a, a, 
an indication of what I would say is part of the problem in, in my assessment of things, um, having done this job now for about 10 months. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think personally, you know, certainly speaking from a local perspective, that's spot on, really. And I think that whole piece about kind of schools needing to have, be more mental health focused and inclusive helps families massively. Because it's not just about people being referred for treatment. It's about, you know, getting children to school, helping them to feel engaged in lessons, you know, helping them with things like anxiety and I think one thing we haven't touched on there, which is, you know, a massive um, topic in itself, but is around neurodiversity assessments for children, because mm. children are waiting, you know, up to two years to be seen for a first assessment. And then when they're actually seen for that assessment, they're discharged from services. So, you know, it's, it's you know, it's fine. You wait two years for an assessment, you get the diagnosis and then there's no further support. So I think it's another area that we need to shine a light on, really, that's that's happening everywhere at the moment. Yeah, and even just an assessment of how fit for purpose our current secondary and primary education system is, uh, yeah. it, it actually yeah, yeah. meeting the needs of young people and preparing them yeah. uh, for their futures yeah. and finding their passion uh, and purpose in life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're still stuck in a largely Victorian education system, yeah. uh, even down to the demarcations between yeah. subject areas and bells and yeah. periods and so on. So I think like we need to to actually think about it in a more holistic sense. Um, a lot of young people just feel that you know, school is, is is boring. It isn't it isn't something that stimulates them. How do we find what it is that really makes them tick? How do we find their passion uh, and purpose? And yeah. I think that's a key part of what we need to do as well. And that's where the Venn diagram of public policy starts to come in, where education yeah. and health really are key components. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're doing with teachers and, and training teachers and so on is, is part of that picture as well. Um, a whole yeah. approach to national resilience is, is key to that, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we're getting to a point now where we're going to need to finish up soon. So let's just come to um, people for any sort of last questions or comments they might want to make. Mike, is there anything you wanted to say just to finish us up? No, uh, not, not particularly. I, I suppose just to just to um, uh, book in some of the discussion that I think, you know, the priorities around uh, children's uh, health, substance misuse, um, the cohesion and the resilience within our societies are really important. And I, I guess they all influence another of the big topics that we've not talked about. We don't have time to talk about is our, is our, uh, is our uh, very high suicide rate in Scotland as well. But I think if we tackled those other three problems, we'd start to make inroads into particularly male suicides um, uh, as well. So um, uh, thanks for the insights into those key areas. Well, the, the interesting thing about talking about the drug death crisis in Scotland is a large part of that isn't necessarily about suicide, but it's about ambivalence to being alive, you know, and yeah. there's, there's a significant relationship there. Um, deaths of despair are, 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 you know, huge in Scotland and they're most acute. You know, if you look at the work of the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, for example, mm -hmm. you know, they're saying a decade of austerity has destroyed the, the fabric of a lot of working class uh, communities, etc., um, and it's, it's 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 devastating to see the impacts of that. Um, so I think you're right. A large part of that is building greater resilience in our social security system, but a lot of it's about how we give people a sense of purpose and hope in life. Uh, and that's been in short supply in recent years, I think. <laughs> Indeed, it has. Vanessa, is there anything that you wanted to um, finish up with? Yeah, no. I mean, I think it's been a really interesting, lively discussion. And um, and for me, you know. Um, it's been around kind of humanizing mental health tonight and kind of thinking about all the reasons why somebody might be experiencing mental health difficulties and certainly the link between social justice and inequality in mental health has really kind of come across. I suppose the other thing for people listening and I think which was really important was your challenge back about people getting involved themselves and if you've got an issue um, that's burning for you, you know, get involved, contact your local MP, um, you know, have a voice. And I think, you know, you've really emphasised that, which I think is really important. Mm. So, yes, yeah, I think really it's, it's finding ways to build workers' power. Um, you know, you are the people who create the wealth of this country. Uh, you have the insights, the expertise. Yeah. You know, I see my role as, you know, carrying your voice into Parliament um, in whatever way I can. Uh, you know, that's the role for me. Uh, I'm not sitting here like some wizard with all the, the ideas, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So I think really my 
call back to, to unite colleagues is really to, to to build your power through the union and to, to to communicate with parliamentarians and we'll carry that voice and I'm a unite MSP as much as a Labour MSP you know mm. uh, and mm. I want to carry that voice into parliament mm. yeah. thank you thank you and thank you ever so much for your time today and for your for your openness Paul to discuss things you've been very uh very chill about it all that's been really helpful for us so is there anything yeah. else you wanted to just leave people with or before we finish up Really, just to to say, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I hope it's been useful. Mm. Um, you know, and and I think it's about deepening and building that bond uh, across the movement uh, that we can we can uh, improve public policy. Um, people shouldn't feel that they're alienated, that they're in despair, they have no agency. Uh, you know, we're here to try and fix problems. You know, uh, government can often be. Uh, you know, aloof from these things, but the biggest problem with communication, uh, as George Bernard saw, said, was the illusion it's, it's ever happened. Uh, you know, so the more communication, the more connection, the more feedback we can get, the more we're aware of problems and the more we can fix them and the more we can improve your lives uh, and then hopefully give you a more fulfilling working life. Uh, and that's really something I can, you know, if I can help do that, then I can step away from the job in how many, many years with a sense of satisfaction um so mm. get get stuck in and don't hold back that would be my recommendations thank you very much i can't think of a better way of finishing up so thanks everybody yeah. for watching really appreciate that and good night everyone good night all oh, bye pleasure mm. see you